BioBalance HealthCast episode 257, New Treatments for PTSD. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counsel. Hopefully this is a welcome back and you're a regular viewer of our HealthCast, but we are continuing a conversation this week that we began in our last podcast uh, about PTSD. And PTSD is a psychiatric diagnosis, a mental health diagnosis, that has very specific meanings. And those meanings have been sort of redefined and reclassified in the most recent publication of the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. This is the fifth revising of the DSM. And in this category, they've actually pulled PTSD and trauma-related disorders out of panic and anxiety attacks, which was the cluster that they used to be in. And they've created their own trauma and stressor-related disorders. And they have four subsets of those that range from acute stress disorder, or ASD, adjustment (laughs) disorder, AD. And in children, uh, reactive attachment disorder is also considered a PTSD trauma Mm -hmm. situation. Uh, And then PTSD. And so we talked about PTSD in our last podcast, who gets it, who's susceptible to it, how they get it, how it's treated, how you recognize it. And we reserved a set of information for its own discussion, which has to do with the biochemical reactions of the brain and the body and the medicines that are being developed to help modulate those or remodulate those to help fight the, the PTSD. Uh, Kathy knows so much more about it than I do, and she will walk us through this. But my understanding is it has to do with the flooding uh, of the brain caused from stimulus uh, experience in the midst of a trauma. Yes. And that Mm -hmm. all the different chemical things that happen can actually work as a classical conditioning experience, you know, where you, where you touch the hot stove and you jerk your hand mm-hmm. away, uh, and lock in a learned behavioral reaction, survival reaction to that trauma mm-hmm. that then re-experiences whenever you're in a similar trigger environment. Well, that's that's a, exactly a great overview. What happens when we experience trauma or fear or our normal base human brain says, uh-oh, I've got to run. It's fight it's or flight. It's an old crap reaction, big it's, time. Yeah, well, yeah. but it's it's fight or flight. Yeah. I mean, we, you've heard that millions of times, but what that means chemically is that your, your brain floods with norepinephrine and epinephrine. That's like a stimulant. That stimulant then also sends messages to your pituitary, which stimulates your adrenal to make more adrenaline, more epinephrine and norepinephrine, which goes out to all all of your cells and it stimulates all of them. It puts you on alert so you can do greater than human lifting to get your child out from underneath something heavy or you can you know it gives you the ability to run faster than you could ever run if you were just jogging the stories you see about the grandma that lifts the volkswagen up off the little kid yes and there's no physical way she could do that that's the fight reaction the flight is running faster than you you've ever run before it blocks all of the all of the receptors in your body for pain and for uh, thinking about other things, it completely focuses you on one thing, and that is survival. Okay, so we need this response. This response is important to our our life and to living as a human being. The problem is, if we've experienced a trauma and we are susceptible to that trauma, not everyone who experiences a trauma has PTSD. Right. But if we experience a trauma, we go through this process, and some people who are susceptible to that, or if they've had repetitive trauma. Other traumas oh, in their background. They, yeah, they get trauma overload. Or trauma over and over and over again of yeah. the same type. Right. They experience this. It, it's kind of like a Pavlov dog kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You, you have a stimulant that you then respond to with this unbelievable reaction with all of this epinephrine. So you are continually 
Epinephrine is a is, neurotransmitter. It's both a neurotransmitter and it is it is what adrenaline is okay. and from your adrenal gland. So it's both. That's why you have an EpiPen. Right. When you have an EpiPen, what epinephrine does is it makes your heart race. It makes you breathe faster. It makes you focus your brain. It, it um, basically makes you have supernatural uh, muscular ability. It, it also stimulates blood sugar. Blood sugar goes way up because you need it because you're going to run or you're going to fight. So many of these things occur physiologically when you first experience a trauma, which is normal, but then when you aren't experiencing a trauma but are remembering the trauma. Or encounter what's called a trigger. Right. And if there's some, it, it's uh, uh, if you've ever thought about deja vu, does mm -hmm. deja vu really happen? Do people really have a time warp where they can see an event in the future or see in, you know, uh, one of the most common theories for deja vu? One is, yeah, you can see the future, you know, you're psychic, you're mystic. But the other one is what they call the theory of selective retention. So I only have so many blue shirts. I often have a yellow pen. You occasionally wear that dress. If somebody saw us today, and they had those little selected pieces from several past scenes. Mm -hmm. It would gel in their mind and they would say, whoa, deja vu. I just had that experience. Right. Okay. Okay. So that's a similar thing. You're in an environment where there's some selective retention of a trigger. Mm -hmm. Maybe you see uh, a crippled dog running across the street. Maybe you hear a child cry. Maybe you hear a car backfire. Uh, maybe you hear a gun cocked. Whatever it might be that was also present in the trauma can be a trigger that to this makes you physiologic response. Yeah. So you should re know and remember that every psychiatric disease has a physiologic link. When we call it a disease, we're talking about our brain and, and how it works is, is through chemicals that are are communicated between neur neurons. Electrical, chemical. Electrical, chemical communication. Flesh, yeah. So when you have a psychiatric disease like schizophrenia, that usually means you have an, a, too much dopamine. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter that increases for schizophrenics. They genetically or usually genetically have too much dopamine and that's what causes it. So everything has a reason for... The activity and what we think and what we do is all based on right now in my brain all these neurotransmitters are going going crazy because I'm thinking and I'm talking at the same time so when you have so when we're talking about a trauma we're talking about chemicals and we're talking about chemicals we can as physicians we can offer help to we can change the chemical to change the thought we can change the chemical to change the behavior of someone. We have chemicals that decrease dopamine and then actually cause schizophrenics to be normal. We can do this. So even in trauma, okay. we can do this. Chemically castrate we pedophiles. Can... Yeah, but that's a little different, but yeah. that's okay. But it's a, but it's a simple process. <laughs> Wait, it's I a started... little different. It's a chemical yeah. that, that, that actually... Um, Changes neurotransmitters. So, so you're sitting here thinking, talking, and all those neurotransmitters are firing. But the way your body is wired, if there is an intrusive demand signal, your body is wired to override what you are doing and experience that intrusive demand right. signal. And that's what a flashback is. Mm -hmm. If somebody is in the presence of one of those triggers, even though they're functioning normally, they're making change at the grocery store, they're driving down the highway, whatever it might be, they're supervising the kids on the playground at recess. If one of those triggers goes off, they go into hypervigilant, hyperreactive mode, or they go into dissociative disconnect mode, one or the other. Right, and that has to do with different neurotransmitters they're, they're feeling and using. Mm -hmm. However, I have, I have a... a experience of people coming women women coming into my office and say and telling me that they're 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 afraid they're fearful you can tell they're fearful and they tell me the symptoms that they have been experiencing yeah which are low hormone exp uh, symptoms right. however they've been told over and over again by very abusive or 
strident or forceful physicians that they have nothing wrong with them and that they are crazy. Seriously. That's what they tell them. And I've heard this so many times now, I believe You say that in your book, Crazy, Fat, and Lazy. Yeah. Well, they told me that too when I, but I wasn't, but because I have other data and I knew I wasn't crazy and I had gotten fat and I knew I wasn't lazy. I mean, I knew (laughs) that, but I had a reality to base it on and I had knowledge to base it on. But these, these patients that come see me, they've had their entire reality destroyed. They, they have been told not to believe what they feel. Right. They have been told they're imagining it, that this is normal, that this is, this is something that should happen. When in fact, that I want you to remember this, that is a lie. When you have the symptoms of testosterone deficiency or estrogen deficiency, that is not normal. That is not something you have to live with. And you should not be experiencing trauma from doctors. So my patients come in, they sit down, they, they, they look at me with this fear and they kind of dissociate. So I have to pull them back and say, you're safe now. You have something that's real and we will fix it because that's what you do when you're doing counseling. And you are not crazy. And then they break down and cry. But, they're, but they have a fear of going to doctors from then on out. After all of those experiences, they still get tachycardic and sweaty on their way into my office, even though they know it's safe. Right. I, I was smiling because I remember in, in a previous set of podcasts, we did some testimonials from patients of yours. And they're out on the web. If anyone's interested, they can look it up. But there was a woman who came in who thought she was crazy. Because she had some of these symptoms, and not, she was not told trauma she was, based, but she told she was crazy. She it was, was a trauma was in crazy. itself from a doctor. And you reassured her that she was not, and she broke down and cried, and with relief. And, and that's you, not uncommon. I I know that. And we want you to know that. So so, there there's many messages here. PTSD is one, but you can be traumatized by medical care, <laughs> sadly. So when when a physician just doesn't no, something they should just say I don't know. But if they cover their their lack of knowledge with calling you names, then you need to go someplace else because and you need to not doubt yourself. So that was one of the things that I wanted to say because I think that's an important message for the people listening. I don't want you to be have PTSD over physicians talking to you. No. So, you, but it can also. I mean, it, it's such a fine line because you can train yourself or be trained to regulate your system in response or mm-hmm. in the presence of these triggers. Right. And one of one of the ways we look at that is for treatment methodology. If you have PTSD, and I can isolate the triggers or you can isolate with me the triggers that you're experiencing we can retrain how you define recognize and experience those triggers so that you don't have a panic reaction but another is that you can be trained to be in the presence of those triggers and not have that reaction and that's what a lot of first responders experience Mm -hmm. and a lot of military experience and they are trained to still be able to function in the midst of a set of stimuli that would freeze the rest of us or destroy us. Right. Bombs going off, bullets flying around, buddies it's a screaming. Desensitization that they yes. do in medical school. They have us yes. watch violent movies and desensitize us to that because they know that we're going to see violence. If you're doing triage that, at an accident with forty bodies coming around, mm-hmm. you can't have a panic attack. You right. have to because you're the one with the medical skill and you have to function. Then and you this go isn't home. What we do with PTSD. This is what we do to prevent yes. PTSD in people who are first responders who have, who are all physicians have to go through this. We had to watch violent sexual movies. We mm-hmm. had, I mean, if I know that no one really talks about this, but right. we had to watch all kinds of unusual things right. because they wanted us to never be, never be rattled. So you can prevent this. And this is what we do usually in training of the military and training of physicians, but it doesn't work for everybody. Some people are more sensitive. Some people have, I mean, everyone is so different. So some people have different neurotransmitters that respond more quickly to stress. I mean, I know that I had to just 
no matter what happened, no matter how much bleeding was going on in OB, you know, babies, you had to just... You have seconds to save somebody's You have seconds life. to save somebody's life, and you have to just shut everything else out. If your phone rings, if your child cries, if somebody's... If your your husband's calling you on the phone, nothing matters you except that one disgusted, thing. You can't be or afraid. Right. You have to be focused, and you have to function. And then that leads over to why doctors are considered cold, because... We lack they go that into doctor mode. We yeah, we go into doctor mode and we yeah. lack that hysteria that most people would have. Mm -hmm. So so there's all kinds of things you can do to prevent this or uh, change my you know, my neurotransmitters or yours so that you don't do this. So what but I wanted to talk about the hormones. Yes. Because it's very important to know what's going on in your body. My process is always go backwards in physiology and find out what happened first and if you can stop that then the rest of the physiologic responses aren't going to happen. So, in general, we know, and we've talked about norepinephrine and epinephrine is the first right. thing that happens when you're traumatized. And it's the thing that stimulates everything down the line. All the other hormones are then stimulated by the norepinephrine. So, to make norepinephrine, you have to use your dopamine, Okay, so dopamine makes norepinephrine. So for your body to make more norepinephrine under trauma, your dopamine drops. Because... It's like burning the sugar, so you have right, the energy. You have to use all the dopamine so you have none in your brain. Right. So what that does, that impairs memory. That impairs you being able to ha have a conversation with people. It's kind of a socializing mm -hmm. uh, kind of a neurotransmitter. But it also... Um, it, if you have a low dopamine, it's kind of like Parkinson's. You kind of lose your your expression. You you, you become and more stoic you become solid. yeah. You don't have you don't have like you know. It's kind of like they botoxed your whole face. So I mean, seriously, you can't you don't raise your eyebrows. You don't your face is is very is very um, static, and you also don't have like you're not going to be doing this with your hands either. So uh, a lack of dopamine is a lot like being in slow-mo and it is one of those things that occurs when people re-experience their their uh, trauma right. so that's adrenaline low dopamine and then your cortisol is low because you've used it all up your your stress increases your cortisol every time you have you have a, a reaction so your cortisol is going up your adrenals overreacting until it wears out and then your cortisol is very low and then the last thing is serotonin, the feel-good hormone. Feel-good hormone um, is very low. That's why we use antidepressants in post-traumatic stress. But the first step is epinephrine. All of these things are downstream from epinephrine. So the new drug, which is not a new drug, but the new use for a drug mm. um, is a beta blocker. Now, here's how beta blockers work. It's there. That's a blood pressure medicine or a heart medicine, and generally we're using it to slow the heart down. It is actually it, it is a medication that goes not to the hormone itself, but to the to the um, receptor site. It's where the hormones received on the organ. Like if you if your heart's beating really fast, you take propranolol. It goes your the propranolol's sitting in the receptor site so that the epinephrine can't make it go fast. So this is a drug I know a lot about because I have to take it for tachycardia. So so it it actually is one of those things that blocks the end, not the beginning. So you you spin out with your uh, flashback. Your epinephrine goes up and then at the all your cells are blocked by propranolol. So the key is to give somebody the propranolol at a low enough dose that it doesn't make them tired because it can slow their or decrease their blood pressure because too much because it can or to slow their heart rate too much yet block everything else that hyper reacts to a trauma and this has been studied it came out the research came out in the um, endocrine news which is like a pre endocrine journal endocrinology is the study of hormones in medicine and so this is new but yet it's an old drug mm -hmm. and it is I love it because it's the first step 
You stop the first step that then triggers everything else. Right. And then that stops you from having the responses, the reliving of everything, the the fear. You don't feel that part anymore. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take away your emotions. It doesn't make you less of a person in any way, but it makes you less anxious. And it's it's very similar in operation to the antidepressant drugs and the anti-anxiety drugs. What mm -hmm. those drugs do essentially in short form is they put a floor and a ceiling under your body's physiological reaction. Mm -hmm. So you feel what you feel, you know what you feel. Mm -hmm. It doesn't like make you like uh, Valium. It doesn't make you dumb and you mm -hmm. not know what's going on. Uh, you still feel it, but you don't feel it at such an extreme. Mm -hmm. Your body, and that's what a beta blocker does, so mm -hmm. that you don't have that surge and then have a heart attack. But beta blockers have less side effects mm -hmm. than serotonin reuptake inhibitors, all the antidepressants that we use, or MAO inhibitors. Right. Or, I mean, it, it is just like what we do with testosterone. Mm -hmm. The first step in aging is low testosterone. We give you back your testosterone, the aging process slows, and you don't get the diseases, and you don't have the le lower quality of life as you age. I like stopping things at the first step. Right. That's just my personality. In fact, that's why I went into OB, because I didn't want to take over the babies that didn't come out very well from yeah. the OBs. I wanted to be in charge of making sure the babies came out okay. <laughs> I wanted to go back to control square issues. one. Yeah, I, I feel what we yeah, call it, control issues. But. And I don't care. Because that, <laughs> that actually, it, it, my control issues actually were turned inside out into yeah. something good. And that's, yes. that's my last message is for all of you have had terrible experiences and maybe helped with this, right. I want you to think about what those terrible experiences did that helped you? Because I could have looked at hundreds of experiences in my life that were terrible or life-threatening mm -hmm. or, or fearful. And instead of becoming fearful, I took them and I said, what can I learn? I learned this. I learned that. I learned this. If I had not had all those terrible experiences, I would not be a doctor. I would not have married who I married. I would not have the wonderful child I have, and I would not have had the relationship with her. So you know, Kathy, it is inside out. Just turn it inside out because you can't, it harms you to wallow in it. The, the point you make is so critical, and, and we're going to see an explosion in PTSD-related disorders in the next 20 years. And a lot of that is because people that we call first responders, the military, special forces, are going to be suffering from PTSD. And one of the sort of membership criteria to be in those masculine-oriented groups is toughness. And they try to tough their way out. And mm -hmm. they think it's a, a weakness and a failing if they recognize and ask for help. And so families are critically important. If someone you love is manifesting the symptoms of PTSD that we discussed today or that we discussed in our previous podcast, please try to get them some help. Uh, get them to understand that what they are experiencing is normal and treatable and survivable. Uh, and that if they don't treat it, it can destroy their relationships and it can destroy their lives. It's I, really important. I want to add one other thing because I think we're talking about medical treatment. And medical treatment's critical. But for some people, they need spiritual treatment. Yes, oh, they absolutely. Need, they, need, they need treatment and being by their pastor or by their priest or by their... It, assuming they know what they're doing. Right. Assuming they... And usually you look for somebody who has a... Uh, uh, some kind of degree in counseling and in being the pastor. Usually each church has that within the church. They have someone who's educated uh, to be a counselor. but Or a friend who will walk you through and hold your hand while you're going through this because spiritual, spiritual um, health is very important to your neurotransmitters in your life as well. And I think that that's something that we forget in medicine, but is very integral to our lives. So not only do we need the medicine and the counselors and and changing our own attitudes about this, but we also need a spiritual uh, leader as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. 
For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.